Hey everybody, have you ever thought about why you're so rich? Yes, you. You are super rich compared to almost everybody in human history. How did that happen? The short answer is trade, but stick with me to find out more. And be sure to like and subscribe while the music plays. Adam Smith famously wrote about the division of labor, describing how everybody becomes richer because of trade. Try to imagine what life would be like if trade didn't exist. We'd all be desperately poor, using all of our time and energy just to try to feed and clothe ourselves to just survive to another day. But with trade, we're able to specialize and do something that we're good at, hopefully even something that we might enjoy, and trade our labor in exchange for other things that we want that were made by other people. I didn't build my house or grow my own food. I didn't make this shirt or the camera that I'm looking into right now. None of it. But I was able to trade for it, and I'm much, much better off because of that. Speaking of trade, be sure to check out the description for links to get the notes for this video and some great resources that I've made for you. Okay, since I've already hinted at it, let's start with specialization. Specialization is when each of us focus on doing something that we're good at instead of trying to do everything ourselves. So I don't grow my own food and make my own clothes. Instead, I teach economics and U.S. government to the students in my classroom and all of you here on YouTube. And then I trade the money I earn from teaching for things like food and clothing and pairs of Jordans, obviously. The idea here is known as gains from trade. But how do we decide who should specialize at what? Well, we have two types of advantages, absolute advantage and comparative advantage. Absolute advantage means that a person can produce more of a good or service than anybody else with the same resources. Put simply, it means that they are the best at producing that thing. They can make more, they can do it faster. Comparative advantage, on the other hand, means that a person can produce something at a lower opportunity cost than the other person. Now, I have good news for you. When we're doing these kinds of questions, we're going to assume that there are only two people or two countries and that they can each produce one of two things. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example of what we're talking about. Okay, so here we have Japan and Canada, and they can make cars and computers. This is an output question because it's showing us how much each of them can produce. Japan can make 100 cars or 1,000 computers or some combination of both. Canada can make 50 cars or 750 computers, or again, some combination. Let's start with absolute advantage. Who has the absolute advantage in making cars? Japan, because 100 is greater than 50. It's honestly that simple. How awesome is that? Japan also has the absolute advantage making computers because 1000 is greater than 750. But here's the thing. We don't trade based on absolute advantage. In this case, Japan has the absolute advantage in both cars and computers, but both countries, including Japan, can still benefit from specialization in trade. I'll say that again. Even if a person or country has an absolute advantage in both goods, they can still benefit from specialization and trade. So how do we decide who should make cars and who should make computers? This is where comparative advantage comes in. Like we established before, comparative advantage means producing something at a lower opportunity cost than the other person or country. Opportunity cost refers to what we gave up. So here, we're going to calculate the opportunity cost for each country of producing cars and computers. So what is Japan's opportunity cost of producing one car? In other words, each time they make one car, how many computers did they give up the opportunity to make. Because this is an output question, when you're setting up your ratio, I want you to remember the acronym OOO. Ooh. In output questions, the other good goes over. Output other over. Since we're solving for the opportunity cost of one car, it means we set this up to be computers over cars, or 1000 over 100. Simplify that and we arrive at 10 computers. This means that for every one car Japan makes, it is giving up the opportunity to produce 10 computers. Now we do the same thing for Canada. Computers over cars, so it's 750 over 50. Simplify and we get 15 computers. For every one car Canada makes, it is giving up the opportunity to produce 15 computers. 
But what we do now is compare the opportunity costs. Remember, comparative advantage means to have the lower opportunity cost. So who has the lower opportunity cost for making cars? Well, it's Japan because 10 computers is less than 15 computers. It's really not too bad, is it? I'm gonna do the same thing again for computers now. Pause the video real quick if you wanna to try to solve it first. Okay, so back to Japan. What's the opportunity cost of one computer? All right, well, we do it again. Since this is output, the other goes over when we make our ratio. That means cars over computers this time, or 100 over 1,000, which simplifies to one-tenth of a car. For Canada, it's 50 over 750, which equals one-fifteenth of a car. So this time, Canada has the comparative advantage because it has the lower opportunity cost. One-fifteenth of a car is less than one-tenth of a car. There are really two important things about these answers that I want to point out to you that aren't coincidences. First, did you notice that Japan had the comparative advantage making cars while Canada has the comparative advantage in making computers? It'll always be that way. Each person or country must have the comparative advantage in producing one of the two goods. And the reason that will always be true is because of the second thing. Did you notice that for each country, their respective opportunity costs were reciprocals of each other? Japan's opportunity cost for producing cars was 10 computers, and then for producing computers was one-tenth of a car. It'll always be like that. Okay, quick disclaimer. You could be given a question where both people or countries have the same opportunity cost, in which case the answer is that neither has a comparative advantage, but that's extremely rare. Now that we know who has the comparative advantage for each, we also know who should specialize in what. Each country specializes in whatever they have the comparative advantage in. Japan in cars and Canada in computers. This means that Japan will only produce cars, while Canada only produces computers, and then they will trade with each other. At this point, we can also establish specific terms of trade. We know that each side can gain from trade, but specifically, how many computers should Canada trade for cars from Japan? Make sure that each side is giving up less in this trade than they'd have to give up if they decided to make both goods themselves. Or we could say it another way, which is to make sure that each side gains more by giving one of the good that they're producing than they'd gain if they were making both goods themselves. Canada is going to specialize in computers, right? But without trade, if they wanted one car, they'd have to give up the opportunity to produce 15 computers. So for Canada to benefit from this trade, they need to give up fewer than 15 computers per car. If Canada was asked to give up 16 computers, they'd be better off making the car themselves since it'd cost them less that way. Japan is specializing in car production. Without trade, if they chose to make one less car, they'd be able to make 10 computers. Therefore, for Japan to benefit from trade, they need to receive more than 10 computers per car. When we combine those two things for both sides to benefit, what we call mutually beneficial trade, the terms of trade need to be one car for somewhere between 11 and 14 computers. Both sides will be better off in this case. And you might have noticed that the terms of trade fall between both countries' opportunity costs. Again, this isn't coincidence. It'll always be just like this. Okay, the very last thing I need you to know in this section is that sometimes instead of being given the output produced by each person or each country, you'll be given the input. Typically, this means saying how long it takes for a good to be made. In this case, we're going to calculate absolute and comparative advantage slightly differently. We're going to refer to these as input questions. For input questions, the absolute advantage belongs to whoever can produce something using fewer resources. So the smaller number has the absolute advantage this time. When we calculate opportunity costs for comparative advantage, we're going to set up our ratio differently. I want you to remember the acronym IOU. For input questions, the other good goes under when we set up our ratio. Pause the video if you want to solve this one out. I'm not going to go through it verbally, but I'll just show you the answers in just one second. So quick pause, solve it if you want. Now, once we've calculated our opportunity costs at this point, everything is the same as before. The lower opportunity cost has the comparative advantage, and whoever has the comparative advantage should specialize in the production of that good. 
Okay, once again, congratulations for surviving this lesson. I know there's a lot there, but you're doing great. Until next time, this has been a La Money production. Thanks again for watching. Please hit that like button if you didn't already, and be sure to check out the description for the answers to the practice questions and links to some of the great study aids I've made for you. See you in the next video.